Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director and the co-head here at TIFF. I'm glad to see all of you here tonight for a very special screening of David Cronenberg's Crash with special guest Viggo Mortensen. We like to begin by acknowledging where we are, and we are on the treaty, ter treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat. We're grateful to them for taking care of this land that we're on for countless generations, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community. On behalf of TIFF, I would also like to thank all of the people and the organizations who make this night and everything we do possible, beginning with our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris, and Visa, and uh, TIFF Cinematech's public supporters, Ontario Creates, and the Canada Council for the Arts. Thanks as well to Classic FM Radio and Zoomer Radio, who are the sponsors of the program. And a big thank you to our donors and our members for making our year-round programming, our educational and community outreach initiatives possible. We are a charitable organization. We could not do it without them. And in some cases, I think you uh, here tonight, donors and members, thanks to all of you. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is have Mr. Mortensen join us for an introduction to the film, followed by a screening of the film. And this is, of course, David Cronenberg's very controversial and in some parts of the world banned uh, tale of bodily trauma and desire. Uh, one special note, what you're going to see tonight is a 35 millimeter print from TIFF's own uh, print collection, the Film Reference Library's screening collection, which was selected uh, by Vigo himself. I gave him a rather daunting list of all of the films in our collection, and this is one of the films he chose. He was here last Saturday screening our Carl Theodore Dreyer's Passion of Joan of Arc. Uh, some of you, who was here for Passion of Joan of Arc? Anybody? Good. Um, so uh, he has been very generous with his time in offering to present two of his favorite films to our audience. Um, I'm sure many, most of you here know Vigo's work uh, very well since his debut as a young uh, um, Amish farmer in Peter Weir's Witness. His film career has been marked by a string of really remarkably diverse and strong performances. Uh, he's made over more, uh, more than 40 films, including The Road, Appaloosa, The Lord of the Rings trilogy, A Walk on the Moon, Portrait of a Lady, Carlito's Way, The Indian, Ru Indian Runner, The Reflecting Skin, as well as a number of Spanish language features. You may know Vigo speaks uh, Spanish and Danish in addition to English. Uh, Alatrista, La Pistola de, de, de Mi Hermano, Hauha, and Everybody Has a Plan. And of course, three films with David Cronenberg, Eastern Promises, A History of Violence, and A Dangerous Method. He was most recently nominated for an Oscar for his uh, remarkable performance in Green Book. Please join me in welcoming Vigo Mortensen. Hello. Good evening to those of you who were here last Saturday. Thanks for coming back. And um, thanks to Cameron and thanks to the Toronto International Film Festival for having this uh, screening series and for showing movies, I think, pretty much every day. In other words, it's not just an event that happens, uh, you know, for a week and a half, two weeks in, in early September. Uh, but it's a year-round uh, passion for showing movies, having conversations about movies, uh, preserving movies, and just promoting movie making and movie storytelling. So I'm honored to be part of that, to not have only been uh, at the film festival several times with all three of those movies he mentioned, of David Cronenberg's and some of the other ones he mentioned as well. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the movie. I think we can discuss it afterwards. How many of you have seen Crash? Uh, and how many have not? That's cool. There's almost 50-50. So we'll see how many of you are here at the end. <laughs> um, but I'll, since uh, many have not seen it, I'm not going to say too much about it. We'll save that for, we'll talk afterwards with Cameron about it. Um, but I, I did write down a couple thoughts, uh, just, you know, why this movie? Because he sent me literally hundreds of, you know, I have a, an impressive list of 35 mil uh, prints. And I chose these two um, 
could have chosen others, but I really, this one, one of the reasons uh, that I wanted to show this movie, apart from the fact that I respect and admire David's work generally, and, and specifically this movie, you know, it's a groundbreaking, uh, thoroughly original movie, like most of his movies are, if not all of them, really. Um, I would say I, I don't like being told what to think. Um, but if I respect someone's knowledge um, and their approach to creating movies or, or anything else, like I do David Cronenberg's, then I don't mind being told or better yet asked to do something. But being told what to think is not something uh, I'm into. And, and David never tells people what to think. And, um, and those of you who have not seen this movie will see that it, uh, it certainly doesn't tell you what to think. You, it will, I would say it would be almost impossible to remain neutral about this movie. Um, you know, I think that, uh, as with all his movies, David's Crash poses a question. It shows us a particular way of living, but without judgment, without moralizing, the moralizing that nearly always seems to um, characterize the work of most movie directors. It's like they can't help it, or, or the studio or the producers can't help it. Yes, but you have to, you have to offer some solace to people. You have to have, give them some guidance. And, you know, David Cronenberg makes movies for grown-ups. Uh, and he figures they can make up their own minds <clears throat> about what they're seeing. And, I, and I've always admired that about him. And so that, that is one of the reasons, apart from the quality of the movie itself and, and how thought-provoking it is, that I, that I wanted to, to uh, that I asked him to show this print. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the movie, and I, and I look forward to talking with you afterwards. Thank you. Let's uh, welcome back to the stage Vigo Mortensen. <laughs> Vigo, I hadn't seen that in a long time. Most people stayed. It's shocking. <laughs> but I love it. It stands up, it's as disturbing, as beautiful, as erotic, as. Uh, I remember, but somehow it just is more potent, I think, the more you see it. I think it gets better, actually. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you've done three films mm. with David. You would have had a chance to talk with him, and maybe even about Crash. Mm -hmm. um, how does his mind work? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. As to, yeah, having worked with him a few times, and also, you know, several of the People on his crew are, you know, longtime collaborators, and I've worked with some of them. I'm actually working with with Carol Spear uh, right now, for example, and on a movie that I'm doing. As far as how his mind works, that's a very, very good question. I mean, how can you know anybody's mind? Um, there are people who who do make a study of, let's say, special or extraordinary minds, like David Cronenberg's, and I do know a couple of people, one, one of whom is um, who's, uh, here, who um, made quite a study of it. I don't know if, if, if they've reached definite conclusions about, about the way his mind works, but I think they have some very strongly held opinions and a certain amount of expertise on the matter, and um, I mean, I could ask them to maybe join us and just, you know, to try to answer that a little bit. I mean, I don't feel comfortable talking about how his mind works. Okay, maybe I, that was could, I, could I invite him? Would it just for sure, a moment? Sure. Why not? Go Is ahead. That, uh, Go okay. ahead. I'm, I'm curious. Um, if you'd like to come out and maybe give us a hand, that'd be great. <laughs> right in the middle. Yeah. He's in the middle. He's in the middle. Hey. Is this live yet? <laughs> I was in Paris ten minutes ago. I don't know what happened. Some weird thing that Tiff has enabled. Some <laughs> transport. Um, 
I actually have no idea how my mind works, of course. <laughs> I'm the last person you should ask. Maybe that's really. just as well. <laughs> but, um, well, I, I must say, I, I looked at Crash for the first time in about th 20 years uh, last week because um, the producer, Jeremy Thomas, is, is, is uh, d doing a... Um, a restoration of it, which it's a little weird to be alive and have your films being restored. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, so I watched it on my computer and I, I laughed through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I thought, these people are crazy. I mean, they're, all they think about is sex and car crashes. What is this? I don't know if you had the same response. <laughs> Well, one thing that I'm, what I thought about, you know, when I watch it again, um, in preparation for being here today, I was thinking, well, essentially, and I'm sure this has been said, lots has been said about the movie, but that, uh, you know, um, intimacy, pleasure, communication, sex can be anything. Really, Vigo? <laughs> that's 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 what Are I you, get you're coming from over tomorrow. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm eight o'clock. Good. All right. After dinner, before dinner, during dinner. Oh, <laughs> but that can be anything, right? And I think that maybe you know, I'm thinking about the the controversy uh, or the censorship, uh, you know, in some places in Britain and other places, and the stir that it caused. The fact that you, I, I said before the movie started, I said one of the things I like about the way you direct movies is that you don't, uh, you're not telling people what to think. And you certainly don't with this movie. You offer a world, a way of life, a way, a behavior. And, there are, and in this one, when I say sex can be anything, that's what I get from it. It could be anything. Pleasure, intimate connection, communication, or lack of communication it can be anything, and maybe for some people, uh, and some institutions, uh, maybe that uh, makes them nervous that there are no moral guidelines. There's no absolutes in terms of what sex is or what pleasure is. You know. Well, when I uh, when Jeremy Thomas proposed uh, the novel, uh, J.G. Ballard's novel, to me, and I started to read it. And after about 20 pages, I had to put it down because I found it quite repellent, <laughs> actually, <laughs> and uh, very disturbing. And um, I said, no, I just, I don't, Jeremy, I can't read it. Um, and then eventually I did read it. And it, it's written in a very cold, sort of medical, clinical kind of way, um, which is, once you accept that is quite extraordinary. And then, but I still thought, but you know, wh how could I, I wouldn't, I can't see myself making this into a movie at all. And then. Um, Did you feel that way about Naked Lunch? No, that was different, mm -hmm. quite different. Because Naked Lunch is funny, and you know, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of humor in it. This, the, the Ballard's novel had zero humor, and zero like self-awareness, it was just what it was. And uh, and it, it it had a weird medical sensuality. It was all described in medical terms. You know, the, the, the parts of the body and the sex was described as almost as a doctor would describe it. Who was, you know, uh, and um, so it was very unsettling in many ways. And then eventually, I was with Jeremy at some film festival. It could have even been here. I can't remember. And then I said, yeah, we should really do Crash. And I totally surprised myself by that. I don't know what was going on in my life at the time. <laughs> I don't know. You know Came out of your mouth and you said, who said that? But um, I did have a Ferrari, I think, at the time. But um, <laughs> that might have had something to do with it. So, uh, but in, in fact, that's, that's a funny thing because somebody said to me, you know, yeah, you're a car guy. You've raced cars and motorcycles, so of course you would like this. And I said, no, absolutely not. This is an anti hedonistic uh, view of, of cars and the beauty of cars and the sensuality of cars. And it's the, the antithesis of that. It's actually you know, a horrible rendering of what, what a car is. 
and 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 has it has its um, subversive reality, you know, sort of underneath the the other reality of what cars are. And, and that was another thing that Ballard did was the way that cars were described was also very cold and very, you know, I mean, you have the John F. Kennedy assassination uh, uh, Lincoln, you know, convertible. I mean, that's that's what the car was to him. It was it's so. Um, not a car movie for car people, um, and um, and um, it, it, I think watching my own movie though I did think that there was a sensuality in it that that is not in the novel. I was trying to do the novel, but things change, things mutate, and and uh, uh, Peter Sushitsky's lighting was very sensual and beautiful and. Um, uh, and some of the, the movement of the cars, uh, the, the choreography of it was kind of beautiful, really. Uh, the, moving, the movement through space and so on. And, uh, Can I ask you a little bit about sure. that part of it? Looking at the film 20 years on, what you really notice is that it's all practical effects. You're shooting, you really made Lakeshore Boulevard uh, come alive <laughs> on... Uh, in the city, and so you're using real locations, you're using real cars, there's, there's none of that sort of digital plasticity to how you shoot those scenes, and the crashes feel so visceral as a result. Can you talk a little bit about how you went about doing that? Because it, it, it looks dangerous as hell. Yeah. Oh, it was. <laughs> it was. I mean, we were on the highway at night. Now, we had control of the section of the highway that we had. We weren't, we weren't shooting with you know uh, civilians out there, but... Um, it's raining and you're hanging off the back of a, you know, I did some, a little bit of shooting myself. We have multiple cameras. Uh, you're hanging off the tailgate of a, of, a, of a camera car and it's raining. It's real rain. You know, we didn't have the, I mean, we were at the mercy of the weather, but it was, it worked out so beautifully, you know, when it needed to be raining, it was. And, uh, but the result is that it's actually yes, it's it's definitely dangerous. We had some great stunt people doing the stunts, uh, but they were really crashing into each other. You know, I mean that w that wasn't fake, uh, but with safety stuff. Um, yeah, it was pre-digital. You know, it just was just like the fly was. So uh, it's it's uh, a whole other kind of filmmaking. Did and you? when it works, when you can do what you need to do. Um, it's in, it is incredibly satisfying, and yes, that does add a sensuality that is palpable, I think, to an audience. Although I must say, there's you know, digital stuff has gotten incredibly good, and and I'm happy to use it when it's necessary. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of little things that we did on history of violence, for example. We people don't think of it this way, but it's another tool that you can use. So you're not creating a creature that doesn't exist, but you are. Um, uh, there was a scene where there was some shooting happening and, and the, the gun and the best take fell into the frame and it wasn't supposed to be there. And you can just take that out digitally. And, and in the old days, you would have to use a, an inferior take because um, the continuity was wrong. Uh, but in this era, you can just get rid of it and put grass there instead of the gun, you know, that kind of thing. If you have if you have the post production budget for it, <laughs> well, but that's that's another thing though. You can that's do getting it on cheaper your phone too. Now. I yeah, mean, it's getting seriously, cheaper. you could do that on a, on a good that's laptop true. now. As far as that thing you're saying, <clears throat> you just blurted out to Jeremy. I think I want to make this, and then thought, what? Who said that? Yeah. Um, did is the was that movie was Crash different than to the movies that we worked on together or any other ones that you've made in terms of knowing why you're making it? Or do you figure that out while you're making it or after you've finished it? You know, why did I want to try to make this story into a movie? I never figure it out. You know? <laughs> I still don't know, you know, really. I don't. What can I say? I mean... You know, I did a dangerous method because I was <clears throat> really intrigued by the relationship of Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud, you know, so the movie gives you a chance. It forces you to do research, and but in a very plastic way because you're not just reading about it, you're taking what you read and what you hear and creating something. Um, so, uh, but be beyond that, and just the uh, it's it's a rebel it's it's exploring you know the human condition basically and so 
there are so many, it's like a, a, a diamond with a million facets, and each facet takes you into the diamond in a different way. And uh, it's a never-ending process, really. I mean, until you die, then it ends. But um, Maybe. Well, for you. No, no for, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I wonder uh, if you could both talk a little bit about character and performance. And Vigo, I'm interested, when you watch Crash, having worked with David on yeah. three different films and been directed by him, what are you seeing in the performances by James Spader and, um, and Deborah Kara Unger and the others? And David, what, how would you define how you work with actors like Vigo? And has that changed from when you made Crash to, to when you made the films that you've made with him? Well, you need to work with crazy people. Yeah, good. But crazy in a particular way. I remember uh, seeing, you know, just at some party in Cannes, and, and Sean Penn was there with Robin Wright, I think, at the time, and he, he, he said to me about Crash, he said, wow, Spader really, I mean, that was an incredible performance, you know, incredible. And, it, and the thing is that he, he was simply not afraid. I mean, that's the thing. You, it, to have no fear, or you can have inner fear about can you... Can you do what's necessary? Can you be good? You know, that the normal creative fear. But there was nothing in it that that phased him, you know, and, and the, even the you know, the the homosexual element in it, um, which uh is something that many of the actors that we talked about were couldn't do. I mean they couldn't just couldn't can manage to do that. Yeah, I could do that stuff with the beautiful girl, but you know. Um so, and there's so many strange things that you have to do to, to play that role. And you have to do it, you can see it so clearly that it just, he was right there. Um, and, and that, I mean, part of being able to unleash that in yourself, unfiltered, is, um, uh, is something not all actors can do, you know, and certainly not well, you, for every you role. Inspire, you inspire a certain confidence in your yes. success. <laughs> You do, you do. Yes, yeah. it's my it's my evil hypnotism yeah, thing. Yeah, you're, you're you're manipulative and evil and uh, <laughs> all those things. No, but you do. You create your sets. <clears throat> in my experience, are calm, can do kind of um, settings, and people feel included. Um, actor, not just the actors, but the crew. There's a very there is, you know, you hear this all the time about movie shit, but there is a sort of a certain kind of family atmosphere that does get created. I remember on History of Violence, the first time we worked together, there was, that was definitely true. And there were some scenes you know, with Maria Bello that also, you know, that is, uh, involved sex. And, there were, and it was, um, we were all, we laughed a lot while we were yeah. doing it. And I, I bet you did on as serious, and there was a certain style that you had in terms of the way they were, Speaking, you know, in reference to your question, the actors in, in, in Crash, and you get it right in the beginning, just the way um, Unger is speaking and the way James is speaking, and then it, it carries through the other character. There's a certain way, and that's the script, and that's you, and the tone you're setting, and you, you're you in, at least I was, I'm in right away, and I was like, okay, this is the way they're doing this. And they were, as you say, they were fearless, you know, all of them. They they did what they had to do, but in a very natural way. You created a, a world, which is what you always do with your movies. You know, I, th I think the, I always say that the first 10 minutes of any movie, uh, you get a free pass as a director, as a filmmaker, I think, you know, it's like you could do anything you want, and after 10 minutes or so, maybe 15, but for me it's about 10. If something isn't happening, then I start to get restless. But the first 10 minutes where you establish the style of that particular yeah. piece, anything goes. And before you know it, with your movies, you're in. You're like, okay, this is the world I'm in now, and I'm watching this. And, uh, and I felt that very much with this movie. And it seemed to me that when I was watching, and it was very serious sometimes, but I was thinking to myself, I bet they did laugh a lot. Was that true? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. Well, I, I could tell you, well, first of all, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I understand, seriously, I understand that Ingmar Bergman sets were actually a laugh riot. I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard true. that. Finding that I heard that there was a lot of humor. On, and now, this is a Swedish director, you know, very 50s, 60s, very serious, mostly black and white, you know. So, um, when I first 
started to direct, uh, I, I made underground films with my friends, and that was my first filmmaking, and I'm completely self-taught. I never went to any film school or anything. Um, but um, when I did, first was working with professional actors who were being paid, and, and uh, I, I, I didn't, I was wary of them. You know, I thought, you can't, you, it, I did think I had to manipulate them, and I had to, because I was under such time pressures, uh, I couldn't, so when they said, for example, why don't I do this scene here, and then I walk over to the window, and I'm thinking, no, you can't go over to the window, we can't afford to relight that kind of the room, <laughs> but I can't tell that to the actor, can I? So I'll, You'd make, lie. Up, I'll You'd make lie. up a reason why it's more <laughs> dramatically valid to stay there. <laughs> You'd lie to them. Yeah, I kind of lied, but 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 entertainingly, yes. and then I realized that actually, except for certain actors, but uh, honestly, it's been very rare that I've had a bad time with an actor. Uh, you could actually tell them that I can't afford to shoot you over there, and so let's try and make this interesting and and collaborate, and then it actually can work. You know, you don't have to be the the, the mysterious guy behind the you know the the the, the curtain. And uh, and that changed everything. And it, it happened very quickly. I realized that it was much better to have everybody be a, co a collaborator, a colleague. And it didn't need an adversarial or manipulative kind of thing. And that's probably where that all developed from. David, you're, you're known for some <clears throat> directing actors to some real signature performances. I think Vigo, all the, the three films you've done, but maybe especially History of Violence and Eastern Promises, such indelible roles. Jeff Glo Goldblum in The Fly and Jeremy Irons in, in uh, Dead Ringers. And I really love what Rosanna Arquette does uh, in this film as well, because she seems there's a kind of a pleasure in her performance that is really palpable. Um, is it, when you're directing actors, is it really about that, that freedom that you talked about, about giving them complete license? Or what is it that, that you think delivers those really indelible performances? Well, I, I don't think actors want complete license. I think what they want is to be heard and to have involvement. Uh, but they do want to be directed. And, and, and so they should. Because they also f know that they are only... A, they're doing certain scenes, but they're not doing all the scenes. And I, I'm the only one who's there for every scene that's shot. So they might be giving a performance that when they were rehearsing their lines, with this new app I have called Rehearsal Pro, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I'm rehearsing my lines right now for Vigo's movie. He's going to get his shot at me um, <laughs> later the, next week. Um, I play a proctologist. That's no surprise, is it? <laughs> Typecasting. And, and I'm not kidding. Um, um, so I always want to see what the actor's first instinct is with a role in a scene. I don't want to talk it out too much. I want to just see what is your instinct? What, what, what do you think you should be doing? Just let them do it. And then if it's not right, then we talk about it, shape it, you know. Um, but I, I, I do trust the actor's instinct. And of course, part of that is casting the right person uh, in the role. That, that's a huge part of it. Uh, um, I just want to tell you something about now that This is something nobody knows, and I'm going to tell you this now. The canes that Rosanna Arquette uses in the movie are in my bedroom. <laughs> and And... They're, they're in my bedroom because... Are they helpful? For, <laughs> well, because you're coming over, Vigo, so you should know. Ah. You can't top them. It's always moving. <laughs> um, because my back went out <laughs> on Monday, and I didn't, wasn't even sure I'd be able to make it here because it was so painful. It was like, you know, sciatic or whatever herniated this blah blah so I was walking around with her canes and I felt the connection <laughs> I wasn't wearing the net stockings oh, if only. not today <laughs> tomorrow Vigo <laughs> and Vigo is there something distinct about how David has directed you uh, compared to the many other filmmakers you've worked with his attention to detail you know his uh 
his powers of observation. You can feel it when you're being directed, <clears throat> and you can certainly see it uh, in the finished product. You know, the work that he does or that he does together with, say, with Ron Sanders, his editor. Um, the, the shots he selects, obviously, in terms of editing, but the way he, I mean, the first movie <clears throat> that we did, History of Violence, that was key. You know, the, the transitions between the two personas, you know, um, they're very, very subtle. And a lot of directors, even if they're watching closely on a monitor as opposed to with the naked eye, uh, they would miss that a lot of times. Then, But he doesn't miss anything. You know, he's seeing just a little, you see a little flicker, a little movement, a little something that goes, you know, uh, that happens in your face. And he would know that that would be just right. So. If you're working with a director who's less observant, <clears throat> there's a risk of doing a little bit too much to make sure that they see that there's a transition happening and that they use it. And then you see the finished product, oh, actually, I really shouldn't have done that much. It really needed much less, certainly in a close-up, for example. And the great advantage of working with someone like David is that he sees those things and he takes care of them. He looks for them. He welcomes them. You know, and he uses them, and and that was true in Eastern Promises also. But any role, really. I mean, even in A Dangerous Method, which unlike those, the first two movies we did, the character speaks a lot, uh, but there are nuances in the, the tone of voice, and you know whether his e ego is feeling <laughs> under threat, or whether he's defending or attacking. It's just slight little inflections of voice. It's not just in you know. Uh, Nonverbal uh, expression, but also in, in, in vocal, you know. And you can, and in this movie, there's a lot of different ways that Spader responds to, say, Eli Elias Cateus's character. You know, as he as he gets to know that person, you see his his body language changes, and and the way he speaks changes subtly. It's not just that, which he was that James was very brave, and that you know everybody was all in for the movie. But there's a transition that I was watching with James making as he's at first a little bit back, and then, and it's also the way you're filming him. He's he's becomes more comfortable in that world, and he gets closer, yeah. and he gets closer in tone and in body language too. I mean, I, the the I've, I've acted a lot in small roles in a lot of movies, and of course, Vigo, I'm looking forward to next week when you will, of course, apply all those. Wonderful director things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Essentially, I'll be getting revenge all day long. I worry. Just remember, I will be wearing the gloves. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> the, and tomorrow um, as well. <laughs> the as an actor, I know I realize, and I was doing it before I was acting, but. You really want to know that you're being observed, that you really want to know that you're actually being watched. Now, you might think, of course, you know, especially with monitors now, which we didn't have in the old days, but now you're watching on a monitor. You can, I actually like monitors because you're seeing only what the camera sees. Whereas if you're trying to f see the actual actor, you're not seeing it from him from the right, the same angle as the camera which in, in the same lighting and everything else, and you're worried about tripping over the lights and stuff. Now you're watching the monitor, you're seeing what the camera's really seeing, but you can still not see. You can still not observe. And uh, because there's so many things that a director's worried about, um, aside from just that performance, and an actor knows when he or she is not actually being observed in detail and feels that he's on his own, you know, as you say, and maybe, maybe, yeah, as you say, maybe exaggerate this a little bit and just in case, and you know, so once you know that you're actually being seen, you can relax and leave that part to the director and then just do the acting. Great. Can we take a couple of questions from the audience? <laughs> well, yeah. they look like a scary group, but okay. <laughs> Hard to tell. Do we have microphones? We do. Great. OK, so we're going to take a little bit of time for some questions. We will start right here. Questions, please. Um, uh, 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Um, David, you're one of my favorite filmmakers, and it's an honor to be in your presence tonight. Um, my question, though, is for Vigo. I, um... Thank Burn. God. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> um, uh... You can go home now. <laughs> okay. uh, go back Vigo, to your crutches. I... I... Vigo, I want to know, uh, to you, what was the most valuable thing to come out from your, relation, your working relationship with David? And has working with him also changed the way you looked at his past films? Hmm. I'll take the last question. The first one's tricky. I'm going to take the second question first. Uh, has it changed the way I've looked at them? Um, I don't know if it has. I can't really say. I, I mean, I, I enjoyed watching his movies before we met. I hadn't watched everything when I worked on History of Violence. Um, I was curious, so I made sure I watched everything. Whatever I hadn't seen of, uh, of his work, I watched all of it. Um, I mean, I'm one of those moviegoers that have for a long time and long before I started uh, that I did my first movie with him that I, I, I would look forward to his movies. What's he going to do now? Um, it's going to, I mean, obviously it's the same person directing, so there's there's some, there's bound to be some linkage and I'm sure there's academics that have made all kinds of conjectures as to what l links his his overall, his work. But, um, but I see each time he goes out, he... He does something quite different. There's a different. There's. It's even if he's working with the same crew. Um, the wet fact that he's working with the same, you know, with Peter Sushinsky and with Carol Spear and with Howard Shore, for example. Some, you know, with the first AD often, you know, and the same team. It just means he's comfortable. They're comfortable. They work well together, and they. There's trust there. So each time he goes out, it's a new. It's a new journey, you know. The difference between his journeys and the journeys of others is that his trips are are memorable, and uh, and um, so and, he, he's and, and, really and, saying no, basically. No, 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 no. His trips are memorable. There are a lot of trips that you'd rather forget, you know, in terms of going to the movies. Every time you go to see a movie, every time you make one, you know, that that process. So yeah, I've uh, I don't know that it's changed anything. I just Maybe I'm a little more interested, you know, in the movies he's done since we worked together the first time, you know, whether it's Cosmopolis or or Maps of the Stars. That was very obviously I know the team he's with, so I'm imagining that. I mean, when I when I look at something that I've done, I often I'm I'm looking almost like you look at a photo album. You you see a photograph of yourself as a kid, say with an uncle or something. And what I'm remembering is 90% outside of the photograph. It's how was that day and who else was there? Oh, that person's dead that was also there, I think, and I was sick or I had the measles, whatever. And that's the same when I watch movies and when I watch now even movies that I'm not in <laughs> that, that David has done because I know that team was there. I imagine certain things that I wouldn't have just having worked with them. But other than that, I don't think my appreciation has grown one iota, actually. <laughs> no. <laughs> and what was your first question? <laughs> I, I think we probably... Will, I don't know why. To, we should go to someone else. Yeah, we should. Anyway, I got out of that first one. That's great. If someone over this side? Uh, question for uh, David. Uh, after uh, seeing the film 20 years later, one of the striking things for me was the good acting job done by Elias Coteas. And I was wondering... Uh, what he brought to the role and how that character was developed? Um, yes, actually, I had tried to get Elias to uh, play a role in um, Naked Lunch, and he had turned me down, and then later regretted it, as all actors do who turn <laughs> me down. And um, so he, I, I, I think, he, so he was very attracted to the darkness in this, but it was a strange darkness, and uh, it, it was. I think it scared him. Um, I think, unlike Spader, I think he was scared. And for for an actor, that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Um, he could push through that being afraid, you know, and. Um, 
uh, and it gave his his performance all kinds of edges uh, because it's such a strange role because the character is such a strange character and such a pivotal character. So it's um, uh, but we basically though he was lovely to work with. I mean, just in he was total pro and and we 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 enjoyed you know we had fun as well. Um, but it was, you know, you're in the, it's doing the car crashes in the middle of the night, you know, the, the, the James Dean crash and stuff. I mean, that's very, very intense, difficult stuff. A lot of, a lot of strange dialogue and a lot of physical, physicality to it and stuff. And he brought, he brought a ton of that, you know, of the physicality, the, the, the strange sensuality, uh, strange perverse mechanical sensuality to the role. He really found that. In himself, so not not sure if I have answered the question, but there it is. Okay, can we go here? Thank you. Hi, Vigo, David. Such an honor. Thank you so much for making films in Toronto and engaging with the community. It's inspiring. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, my question to you: uh, Last week on Le Passion de Jeanne d'Arc. Uh, one of the first lines that she says in front of the line of judges and church prosecutors is uh, one where she defies giving them, she doesn't give in to them. She def refuses to give her consent. And uh, she says, even if you torture me and extract a confession, I'll deny it later, denying them that agency. And so in this film, my first time seeing it, it was so interesting. And I looked for those same themes and I thought about um, the the you made us feel sort of powerful and powerless and through Vaughn's agency you again sort of made the audience feel powerless I'm sure the people working on it and my, my question to you I guess is what what were you thinking and what what did you want us to feel and Vigo in watching it you say everyone who watches it feels it differently what did you feel in watching Crash in terms of the agency and the powerlessness and the uh the other aspects in that degree. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, Alfred Hitchcock loved to uh, posit himself as a, as a marionette master, you know, the, the, that he was a puppeteer and he would make the audience laugh and cry and jump and be afraid when he wanted them to. Uh, I've never, that's never been my approach. I mean, I've never said, okay, I need the audience to feel this and I'm going to go get it. It's quite different. It's like, I'm saying, this is bothering me, it's disturbing me, uh, it's intriguing me, I don't know why. And the only way I can explore it is to do it. And I, therefore, I'm going on this little voyage and um, I'm taking the audience along with me, hopefully, but uh, I don't know where it's going now. And, and I, I'm not sure what I'm going to be feeling, and I'm not sure what they will be feeling either. So I, I really don't have a predefined uh, uh, sort of product, you know. Oh, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, that's, that's the meaning. I, I don't have a, a, a destination in mind, emotionally or intellectually. I just... It's it's always a juiciness, you know. How juicy is this? How, it, 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 you squeeze it a little bit, and it's juicy. You just don't know what's going to be there, but it's going to be great, and it's going to be nourishing, and in some strange way. And that's my approach. So I I can't say what I want anybody to feel. Basically, um, <clears throat> watching it the most recent time, I thought and felt that it was a very thorough, thoroughly committed look at um, a particular way of interacting by human beings. C completely credible and um, involving in the, sen in the same way that, let's say, you travel to another part of the world and you see how people relate. Uh, on the occasion, you know, because of uh, in some right of kinship or marriage or how they walk down the street, how they how they relate to each other in some activity, whether it be be an intimate activity, as you see in this movie, or whether it just be a form of communication, language, uh, the way they dress, you know, things like that. It was a particular small society 
<laughs> that you create in, in on all of your movies, I think, but in, you you certainly see it in this movie. These people live in a way. I mean, there are people around. You obviously had had a lot of extras available to you, and cars and drivers and so forth. But as you go along in the movie, and they get more into it, and James Spader's character gets more and more into it, um, they are. They don't seem to have no any concern whatsoever about being observed. They're very, and that, I'm sure that was intentional on your part. They are self-contained in a sense, and they, which we do, you know, little we, your groups of friends, your groups, people that you relate to for reasons of sexual identification, <clears throat> sporting team affiliations, um, race, cultural background, uh, nationality, so forth, you, you know. It's very, um, they are, uh, they take care of each other. They don't, it's almost like they don't need the outside world when they're fully engaged in their particular way of behaving. And I, I found that very believable. And I like the way that you didn't involve the outside world, even though it's right there in a, in a way. No, because I, I really wasn't interested in the police and the detectives and the tracking down of the who did this crash and who, you know, that, and, and that's, certainly comes from the novel. I mean, the, there's a moment when the police appear for a second and then they're gone. And that that's basically the way Ballard dealt with it in, in the book. Now, you, you were talking about what I might want an audience to feel. But in terms of what I might want an audience to think, well, certainly I was thinking quite a few things. Like, for me, it's always been apparent that technology is basically an extension of our bodies. And, uh, you know, the phone, the ear, uh, all, you know, the television, your eyes, and all, so on, so on. And here, it's almost like a group of people who have want to refuse their bodies with technology, to fuse their bodies again with technology, to bring the technology back into their bodies, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it's kind of a meditation on the strangeness of, of human technology and, and the human body. Um, that's it ends with them fused almost literally the the bodies in the car uh, at the very end of that. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to go. There's a woman right here, I think, who has a question. Yeah, you, you've got your hand up. Can we get the mic over there, please? Thank you. Hi, um, I have a question for both of you. Um, to David, do you think this movie is a good metaphor for like what's going on at the moment with the relationship to technology? Like, in the 21st century, we're very dependent on technology, and this movie is almost done, like, 20 years before, but it kind of shows a sort of dependency on technology, even though it's a slightly earlier portrayal of, like, a more sexual kind of animalistic need for it. And Viggo, um, I was wondering, since Lord of the Rings, have you felt that it's been hard to kind of move away from being typecast as Aragorn-type characters because people still see you as such, like, a kind of... I mean, you basically portrayed, like, a fictional character who was in many people's favorite stories. And so do you feel like that's kind of changed the way people have viewed your movies since then? Or do you think it's kind of stayed it. the I same? I got it. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... I, of course, when I cast him as Sigmund Freud, I was thinking of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that movie. Yeah. Thank you. But um, uh, to, to answer first, uh, yeah, this 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 um, is a kind of different thing. I mean, this this technology in this movie is all mechanical. You know, it's all mechanical. It's all sort of post-industrial revolution. But it's not. You know, I mean, weirdly enough, uh, the movie I made much earlier than this movie, Videodrome, is much more like uh, uh, an anticipation of the technology we have here with a, sort of a television set that is interactive and all that. This is, is in a different space, I think. I don't really think you can extrapolate where we are with technology now, with the internet and stuff, from this movie. It's, it's a more physical, uh, mechanical thing. And no, I've had more trouble trying to get convinced, you know, audiences that I'm not David Cronenberg's personal slave. <laughs> not really. Which not, he is. Which I am. 
so why am You'll I trying so hard to convince them otherwise? <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, uh, no, the Aragorn thing, I mean, there's no, I've never, um, that's never bothered me. I've, it's not like, uh, I've, and I have been, I, I don't, I, I've been asked that question by moviegoers and by journalists since I did those movies, and I don't know why that is. Uh, I suppose just because they made a lot of money and people, and there's also a, a, there are a lot of Tolkien fans and were before the movies were made as well, but I just never been, all, I, I just saw it as a, you know, a windfall in a sense uh, that had it not been for the success of those movies, there's no way that New Line, who made those movies, would have, a, 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 and it might not have even occurred to you anyway, I don't know, uh, or maybe you would, but if, let's say you went to New Line and I hadn't been in those movies and said, I think Viggo Mortensen would be interesting for, for to play Joey in uh, History of Violence, I wouldn't, they wouldn't have approved it. So it's simply, I've got, I've had the opportunity to work with, with you and with some other people and play roles that I wouldn't have. That's how I look at it. But it's never, bought, it's never impeded me from, uh, fully engaging with whatever story I'm I'm telling, whatever character I'm preparing for a, a director. I've never felt like, well, I have to really go to extremes to play something different than, than the role of Aragorn. I, I've, it, that's never entered my mind. I'm, I'm always interested in what's... But how many times on this set have I said, okay, Vigo, it's time to go full Aragorn? <laughs> it's true. Well, you've often called me Aragorn by mistake. I have. I don't usually call you on it anymore. It's like the old uncle who gets your name confused with your brother. And I just let it go. That's true. That's been an, that's an impediment. Yes. We are going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. It's been a great night. I just want to, I know. I want a round of applause Please for David me. Cronenberg. Well. David Cronenberg, Vigo Mortensen. So glad you were here to see Crash. If you drove here tonight, get home safely. And if you have to stop along the way, get out. These guys, they don't even pull off the side of the road. I mean, it's, come on, get on the, you know, on the verge. That's dangerous. <laughs> okay. <laughs>